This remote control plane is powered by six model rocket engines and has a total max thrust of 16.5 kilograms, which means it can do this. Three, two, one, ignition. <laughs> But how did I build this thing? Let's back it up a little. A couple of months ago, I started building this new project at work. It's a very fast RC Spitfire with a huge brushless motor in the front. On its first few flights, this thing already achieved 114 miles an hour with a small four cell battery. <laughs> Now the plane got me thinking a bit more about speed. What is the fastest DIY aircraft that I could possibly build, theoretically? Now it seems that quite a lot of you out there have been liking my rocket projects recently, such as the High Power Rocket and the Kerbal Space Program Rocket. And lucky for you, I've got quite a lot of rocket engines left from those projects. So, why don't we build some sort of rocket plane? This is an Estes rocket engine. It is a black powder engine that can be ignited electronically using one of these igniters. Despite their size, they produce an impressive amount of thrust over a short burn time. These motors don't last long, just a couple of seconds, but it can still be fun to use them to build things like this rocket sled. Three, two, one. As the largest engine I can currently get hold of in the UK is a D12-7 size, which has a max thrust of 32.9 newtons, I decided to start designing an aircraft to use four of these in a cluster configuration. Thing is, I'm not going to be using these rocket engines alone. They have quite a short burn time and I want the aircraft to have a longer flight than just a few seconds. So I'm actually going to be making this a hybrid aircraft with electric power. My concept is to use these in combination with the rocket engines, firstly using the EDF engines to get the plane flying, and then secondly the rocket engines to ignite while the plane is already in the air. We'll cover this more in the next video. The concept is actually quite similar to the one being proposed by a new student-run organisation to build a supersonic unmanned aircraft. They're called Project Boom. I'll post some links to some info about what they're trying to do down in the description, so maybe check that out later. For now, in this particular video I'm focusing on designing a highly streamlined yet practical airframe. This rocket-like configuration with small stubby wings is just wide enough to cram in the batteries, RC gear, other electronics and four D-sized rocket motors. With a final design cadded up and materials gathered, it was time to get building. I used a combination of materials on this airframe, with PLA for the nose and low density plywood to make a strong but lightweight fuselage structure. With high speed landings and high G turns being likely, the thing had to be tough. Wings were made from foam board sheets, laser cut for precision and then folded back over a carbon tube that acted as the main spar. It might have been possible to build thinner, more aerodynamic wings with Depron, but I chose foam board to be reliable and strong. Slotting the sub-assemblies together, it wasn't long before what I was building started to look like my original paper concept. One feature of the engine compartment is the exhaust gas section, which simply evacuates the ejection charge from the motor. Once a model rocket engine burns out, it fires a charge from the rear to usually deploy a parachute. I made sure to leave channels for the gases to escape rather than leaving the resulting pressure to forcefully jettison the engines, which would affect the aircraft's centre of gravity a little. With a skin of lightweight cardstock fitted, I could install electronics and RC gear to the aircraft. One cool little feature I made sure to build in are these flaperons, which can be used to increase the lift of the wings at slow speeds. They have three positions, high speed mode, mid and landing mode, and are controlled by a three position switch on my transmitter. To gather data from the aircraft and to see how fast it went, how high it went and where I went, I installed one of these GPS units in the cockpit area of the nose. To make sure that I didn't lose the aircraft, I used these Bluetooth tiles which show up on your phone when you're within about 45 metres. To launch the aircraft, I built a full-on launch ramp with some aluminium profile. There are small T-shaped 3D printed sliders that fit into the rail, allowing the plane to slide along easily with little friction. 
Fueled up with two motors, a flight battery, electronics and a camera, the plane weighed in at 824 grams, which gives us quite a high wing loading. After a week of designing and building, all was ready for the first test, so myself and my helper Mike headed up to the test flight field to see how it would fly with just two D-sized rocket motors. Three, two, one, ignition. Okay, bring it round. Pretty nose heavy. Ah, it's down. <laughs> yes! That was cool. That was very straight and true. That was awesome. I think I can see where it went down. Let's find it with the drone. It'd be nice if it's uh, in one piece. Oh, yeah. So I couldn't really see when we landed. Oh, found it. Well, this was no good whatsoever. I'm glad they're not sponsoring this video. <laughs> it actually looks like it's in one piece. Perfect. Wow. Well, that was... Uh, success. Yeah, that was a successful mission. Mission accomplished. But how fast did the plane fly with just six kilograms of thrust over 1.6 seconds? 95. Wow, Ooh. that was close. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I shall uh, just stop that and then we can... Uh... Actually, that wasn't quite correct. See if you can spot what's wrong here. Oh, I was holding it upside down. <laughs> was it 59? 56. <laughs> oh, 56. I thought it didn't look that fast. <laughs> uh, back to the studio. Now, watching the first flight back, it's clear to see, as I mentioned at the time. Pretty nose heavy. It tracked quite straight and I was able to control the pitch as we were ascending. But as we were descending and losing airspeed, it was harder to control that pitch as we were coming into land. So I couldn't flare the aircraft in for a nice smooth uh, touchdown. The plane didn't have enough pitch authority to rotate that nose and that means that we need to bring the CG back a little bit. Now in this video, instead of cracking on with the rest of the build with the EDF motors, I decided to repeat the test that I've already done. Boo, I know, that's really boring. But, don't worry, I decided to kick it up a notch, make it more interesting and add some more rocket motors. So yes, that's right, with this plane I've decided to move the CG back by adding more rocket engines into the rear. I've maxed out the rear with the extra D motors and I've also added a couple of extra cheeky C motors on there as well. The couple of C motors down there will hopefully lower the thrust line slightly and give us a bit more pitch up while we're accelerating through uh, the burnout phase. Lighting this cluster rocket is obviously not going to be an easy task and something might go wrong there. Will we have successful ignition of the motors? Will the airframe hold up to the acceleration? Or will the whole thing just explode into a million pieces? Well, there's only one way to find out, really. so far away that we need a compass to actually uh, find it. <laughs> Another successful mission. Now the race was on to find the aircraft, which had flown far out of sight a couple of fields away, and retrieve it before some typical British weather decided to dump a ton of water on the not all that waterproof rocket plane. Not even a scratch on it really. What a stroke of luck. I, I'd call that piloting skill, thank you very much. <laughs> Back in the car we could check on the flight data. <sighs> all, all of the rocket engines Ignited, which is brilliant. Right, let's see what the speed was. Precarious. Yeah. Oh, 
Is well, it, it's in kilometres an hour. Is it We've, definitely the right way up? It is the right way up. Well, it wouldn't matter, actually, because it's 101 kilometres an hour. Ah. Obviously, uh, we've got some work to, uh, to top my record of 114 miles an hour. Uh, miles an hour, that is, so this would be about 60 miles an hour. Yep. So the plane survived and increased its top speed. But what did I learn and what are the next steps? Right then, so the plane has dried off. Um, it's a few days later and I've been looking at the footage to see what happened. Number one, the thrust angle. That definitely was a bit too much on the low side. I wasn't prepared for it on the sticks. I wasn't ready to counteract it and therefore we definitely lost a lot of speed with the uh, high trajectory and uh, as we were fighting gravity. So that probably affected our top speed a little bit, which means that even though we had more than twice the thrust, we didn't have twice the speed. However, moving on to things that did work very well, the wing didn't fold on the uh, high g force that the airframe was subjected to, which is great because otherwise that would have been a very, very short flight. The aircraft actually glided really well, which was uh, surprising. Um, so yeah, we, we, I was able to sort of pilot it around. Obviously, I couldn't actually get it all the way around to us, um, but that being said, yeah, it was good that uh, it came down in one piece, even though I couldn't see it as we actually came into land. Just to reiterate the plan, the rocket engines on the uh, next video are just going to be the boost. We're going to be putting some EDF engines on the underside of these wings and hopefully using those as the primary means of getting up to some high speeds before boosting this aircraft into unknown territories. Now, I've been getting a ton of comments recently asking me how I learned all of this aircraft design stuff and how you can go about doing the same. The answer, aside from trial and error, is mainly reading and watching educational material on the internet. As you can imagine, having access to a platform that can pull together educational resources in one place so that you can level up your skills and learn about subjects you care about would be really helpful. And that's why this video is sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is an app and a website that can help you to develop problem solving and critical thinking abilities along with quantitative skills in maths, science and computer science whilst actually enjoying the process. Here's a little look at the courses that I've been checking out. I've been brushing up with my maths on the mathematics fundamentals course because it's a bit rusty at the moment. There's a course on computer science here, Python, uh, programming in Python and there's a course on scientific thinking here which is as you can imagine very useful to have as a mindset for when you're doing projects like mine and having to overcome problems and challenges. You can go in, start the course and it will quiz you as you go along to test how much you're actually taking in and what you need to work on more. What I especially like is that you can take it at your own pace. You don't need to be an expert to understand the lessons and it's made for all levels of knowledge so that you can start really basic and get to grips with the foundations of a topic before progressing when you're ready. Each course is curated by award-winning teachers, researchers and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Microsoft, Google and places like that. So you're in safe hands. The first 200 people to sign up using the link in the description will get 20% off their annual subscription. So do check that out. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Thank you very much to my amazing Patreons for helping to provide rocket motors and things for these projects. And thank you to you for watching this very video. I will see you on the next one. Bye bye.